Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff. Welcome back. So I'm now here in the chapter three lecture overview, and this chapter is all about cells. So as I did once before, I'll say that again, please be mindful of the understanding words. And I say that because it's imperative to understand the words that are presented here in the chapter, and of course what I'll be saying here as I go over this lecture. So you'll find those on page 85 of your textbook as we begin the chapter. So let us begin. The chapter begins as the cell. So keep in mind that there were scientists that came along and from the, the research that those scientists have done, and of course all the time that they spent looking in those microscopes, they came up with what is known as this cell theory. And what they stated was that the cell is the basic unit of life. So if there is in fact just one cell, life does exist. Thereafter, they stated that, of course, all living things are composed of cells, or at least one cell, and especially in the case of bacteria. And then lastly, what was stated is that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So if you keep that in mind, I say you will do quite well as having a basis for understanding as we continue on. So I mentioned those scientists. They are, of course, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virgil. So as we continue on here, just keep in mind that our cells are small. And the reason being is that your cells have to be efficient in cellular transport. That's why our cells cannot be too large. And along with that, they're measured in micrometers. Thereafter, it states in your text that our cells must go through the process of differentiation. And I'll put it this way, that we all began as, of course, just one cell. As I mentioned, that the cell is a basic unit of life. Well, of course, prior to that one cell, there were two cells called, of course, that egg, and of course, that sperm cell. So as fertilization occurred, we all began as a single cell. And then thereafter, the cell began to, of course, divide, going through cleavage. And with those mitotic divisions, of course, all of those cells that began, of course, as that one cell, that began to differentiate, meaning they began to become more and more specialized, because, of course, all of our cells work together and, of course, carry out some specific function. So as I continue on, it just mentions examples of cells, <clears throat> excuse me, as you see in your textbook on page 86. So if you look closely there in figure, what is called 3.1, in figure 3.1 here, it just shows to your left what is a red blood cell. And this red blood cell is small. This red blood cell is, is measured in, of course, micrometers. Next up, it shows you all a white blood cell there at B. And then thereafter at C, what you're seeing there at C is what is called an egg, as I mentioned moments ago. And then what you see at D is a smooth muscle cell. A smooth muscle cell. So to the right hand side of that, which is figure 2.2, what you're seeing there, are, of course, are just more examples of cells. So, of course, the first of which being at A is a nerve cell. We call that a multipolar, a multipolar neuron. Thereafter, what you have are epithelial cells. And then at the bottom, what you have there with those branched complex networks in C, what would be, of course, called muscle cells. I won't get too specific yet. We'll get more specific later on. So now let's continue on with what is called the composite cell. So with this, what you're about to do is just describe the general characteristics of the cell and explain how the components of the cell provide its functions. I'll continue on now and not read all of those objectives, but class, I would recommend that you pay close attention to the objectives as they are presented here as they begin each and every section. I'll continue now. So with this composite cell, it, it, it begins in such a way that you see here in figure 3.3. So you can look for this figure during your lecture test, being test two, and that test, of course, will be on chapters three and four, as we are now in chapter three. So as you see it here, there are a number of things that make up that animal cell. So with that, there are a number of different organelles that are here, and of course, with each and every organelle, they have a specific function, and along that same way, just keep in mind that it's not that every cell will look like this, but this is that basic structure of all cells. I'll now go back. So with that being the cell, I'll tell you right now that there are three major components that make up cells, and they are as follows. The first of which is that nucleus. So that nucleus is that double membrane bound organelle. I won't go over all of it now, 
but it does indeed contain your DNA, your deoxyribonucleic acid. And of course, that was one of those four molecules of life you all just learned about and had your test on, or at least are about to take your test on. So with that being stated, it contains your entire genome, meaning all those A's, T's, G's, and C's that make you who you are and make me who I am. And of course, half of which came from your mother and half of which came from your father. The next of which would be, of course, that cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is there, and within the cytoplasm, we have, of course, what's suspended called those parts of the cell, called the organelles and other components. And then lastly is the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is what, of course, allows that cell to be separate, meaning it keeps what's within that cell in that cell, and it ensures what's outside the cell stays outside the cell by and large, unless, of course, it is to enter the cell. So from here, we'll keep on moving. So now to that plasma membrane. And as I mentioned the plasma membrane, it, it reminds me of those organelles I just mentioned moments ago. So on your lecture test, prepare yourselves on test two. Prepare yourselves to be able to list and describe nine eukaryotic organelles. Prepare yourselves to be able to list and describe nine eukaryotic cell organelles, both in structure and in function. I'm mentioning this early now because this will be on your one of your essays. This will be turned in and of course will make up part of that grid component of your second test. I'll now continue. The plasma membrane. So that plasma membrane is made up of that phospholipid bilayer. This was of course provided a lot earlier on. So this is what gives the cell, as I mentioned moments ago, the boundary. It keeps what's in the cell inside and of course what's outside the cell is kept outside of the cell because it is a boundary of the cell. So with that, it's thin, it's flexible, it's pliable, and it's because of what makes it up, meaning it's not just that phospholipid bilayer that's there, meaning the phospholipids with, of course, the glycerol head and those two fatty acid tails, but it also contains cholesterol that allows, of course, it to be that soft or pliable portion of it. So with that, I will say it's selective, meaning it is selectively permeable. So this is meaning that not everything that, of course, is around that cell can enter the cell. And of course, not everything that is outside of the cell is gained, I guess you say, exit. So nothing can come in, nothing can exit, unless, of course, it is supposed to, be it, of course, directly through that plasma membrane, or, of course, be it aided by some transport protein. It just depends. Hence, of course, the cell is said to be selectively permeable. So next up will be cell membrane structure. So the way in which the cell membrane is composed, I just gave it to you, is composed of that phospholipid bilayer. So there's glycerol heads and fatty acid tails that make it up. I'll go right back to where I was here shortly. So if you look here at what is called figure 3.5b as in boy, I'll start there. So this is that phospholipid bilayer. This is that cell membrane, that plasma membrane keeping what's in the cell in the cell, and of course keeping what's outside of the cell outside of the cell. So as I just mentioned moments ago, we have those phospholipid, I repeat, those phospholipid heads, excuse me. The heads are made of glycerol. So we have those glycerol heads. So of course it is heads of phospholipid. So right there, those small circles you see are made of glycerol. And then you have the tails of the phospholipid. So those tails are made up of fatty acids. So that each of which is made up of A, a glycerol head, and B, two fatty acid tails. I'll now go back to where I was. So having stated that, this is what allows it to be selective. And if you're wondering how, it's because just by having that lipid bilayer, the phospholipid bilayer, it makes this structure amphipathic. That's A-M-P-H-I. P-A-T-H-I-C, amphipathic. So this being amphipathic means that it will not everything in. And the very same is everything cannot exit. And it's based on, of course, those properties of that glycerol head, which is hydrophilic, and those fatty acid tails, which are hydrophobic, meaning hydrophobic being water-fearing, and hydrophilic being, of course, water-loving. So with that, that middle portion of the phospholipid that I mentioned, the reason that it's there is that it allows those things that are lipid soluble, meaning it's meaning oily, soluble lipid, to of course pass directly through the plasma membrane. So as I say it that way, 
please keep in mind that oxygen can pass directly through the plasma membrane. Carbon dioxide as well can pass directly through the plasma membrane. Hence, of course, in the lungs, we have what is called our alveoli, or to be singular, the alveolus. That is where gas, gas exchange occurs, and it occurs, of course, the, by those very small epithelial cells, those simple spring cells. So, of course, they're very thin, and, of course, it goes, of course, from a lower to higher concentration. We'll get to that moments later. And it also allows steroid hormones to pass directly through the plasma membrane quite easily, requiring no energy from, the, of course, a higher to lower concentration, I would say. However, of course, those water soluble molecules, they are denied entry. They cannot pass through that plasma membrane. So, as I say it that way, those things that cannot pass, for example, as I see it here, class on page 89, are things such as amino acids. In addition to amino acids are those things known as sugars. And not just amino acids and sugars, but I'll also add to that list proteins, nucleic acids, and ions. All of those things are denied entry. And, and some of these, just to bear in mind, are just too large to pass through that lipid bilayer. I'll now continue. So I mentioned already that cholesterol is also a component of that plasma membrane, and it's also, of course, helping keep this plasma membrane that impermeable, impermeable to those water-soluble substances, allowing it to, to remain, of course, amphipathic. So next up, I'll get to, to membrane proteins. So cell membrane proteins, they function to do a number of things, i.e., Let's go backwards. They do function to do a number of things. They come in two types. So cell membrane proteins can be either A, integral proteins, or B, peripheral proteins. So if you look at table 3.1 on page 89, it mentions that those integral proteins may function as forming a pore, a channel, or even a carrier, and even be involved in that signal transduction pathway. So as I say it this way, this is what allows those things that may not be able to pass directly through the cell membrane to pass by way of this transport protein, with some pore formed by a protein. And secondly, are those things known as peripheral proteins. So peripheral proteins, they're there and they're going to be on the periphery of the cell, on the outside of the cell. So in function, they can function as being a receptor, i.e. there may be some ligand or some ligand that attaches to that receptor protein and thereafter you get some sort of a response. They're also able to function as enzymes, being those biological catalysts. As being, of course, you have the enzyme that's there, that peripheral protein. Well, as the enzyme is there, it, it's, of course, it's going to be bound by its substrate, so the substrate attaches at the active site, and thereafter there is, of course, some reaction. Thereafter, it says they could be cellular surface proteins, and then cellular adhesion molecules. These are known as CAMs. We'll get to CAMs a bit later. I'll continue on now. So now that I'm here, I'll just move over because I've, I've shown the picture already. So this shows the cell membrane as I've described it. So you see the glycolipids, you see the glycoproteins, you also see those proteins that are within. So we see the transmembrane protein or the integral protein, and you also see the peripheral proteins, which are at the periphery of the plasma membrane or the periphery of that phospholipid bilayer making up that cell membrane whether inside or outside. And you also see those cholesterol molecules embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. So it mentions now, clinical application 3.1, faulty ion channels. I won't spend a long time here, and I won't read this to you. I'll say, class, take your time to read this. I will say on your own. In the essence of time, make sure you go through what is called unusual pain and sodium ions unusual pain, and sodium ions, and also review cystic fibrosis, or CF, and those chloride ions. And I'll help you out, because of course the clogged pancreas that disrupts the digestion from that buildup of the, th of the thick mucus. So with that, there's a very salty, sweet, and abnormally thick mucus that's there, and likely, of course, a number of infections may ensue with cystic fibrosis. But it deals, of course, with that faulty, I repeat, a faulty or at least abnormal chloride ion channel. Ions are majorly important in the body. And I already mentioned the importance of potassium ions and the electroactivity of the heart. You go back, if you don't remember, we did that back in chapter two. We may have gotten to, of course, the way in which ions are important. And we did that as we were on page 71. Please go back to the lecture overview. 
So now I get to cellular adhesion molecules, they're called CAMs. So what they do is they guide cells that are on the move. So it might be the case that you have white blood cells moving in the bloodstream to the site of an injury, such as a splinter coming in you, or even, of course, from that mosquito bite I just had moments ago from being outdoors. So this is required, meaning those white blood cells are there to fight off infection. So that cell must reach that woody splinter, or must reach the area in which, of course, that mosquito got you. And the white blood cell must slow down in the turbulence of the bloodstream, because, of course, if you look closely, I'm here on page 90, there are a number of things within the blood that are moving and moving and moving. So we have a type of cam called selectin. So what selectins do is they coat those white blood cells and allow them to have traction, kind of like tires. I'll say like tires, not kind of like tires, because tires are, are there strictly, I say, for traction purposes. So with that, the white blood cell slows down to a roll and binds to those carbohydrates on that inner capillary surface. So what this does is, of course, it clots the blood, the bacteria, and even that decaying tissues at the site of injury that release those biochemicals that attract more and more white blood cells. Oh my goodness, this sounds like, well, I ask you, is this sounding like negative feedback or is this sounding like positive feedback? I'll let you all answer that one. If you don't know the answer, ask and I'll tell you the answer. So with, with that happening, the second cam is called integrin. So what integrin does is it contacts that adhesion receptor protein that protrudes into the capillary space near that splinter. So the endocrine then pushes up through the capillary cell membrane and grabs those passing slowed white blood cells and then direct them and then direct them like a towel-like cells of the capillary wall. So what happens here is that those white blood cells collect at the injury site, producing inflammation, which of course is part of that inflammatory response. Maybe a bit of reddening, reddening ensues. It may feel warm to the touch. And of course, you may also have a bit of localized swelling. But with this, it's because with that dying bacteria, you then have, of course, pus to form. That's one thing. The second of which of three would be that CAMs are also critical in the body to guide the surrounding cells of that embryo to grow toward the maternal cells and form the placenta. And of course, if you have not heard, the placenta is that supportive organ that links a pregnant woman to the fetus. And it's, it's because of this that CAMs were also found to establish the connections between nerve cells that underlie learning and memory. So if you're wondering how can you do better in the course, I say A, take notes. I say B, read over those notes you take. C, read your textbook. D, rehearse what's in your textbook, and of course, rehearse your notes, and even rewrite your notes, so that you all can perform well in the course. I'll now continue on, last of which will be, of course, that ab abnormal CAMs, or abnormal cellular, cellular adhesion molecules, can affect your health, meaning the lack of cellular adhesion will, of course, ease the journey of those cancer cells as they spread from one part to another. That's referred to as being metastasis, or being, of course, metastatic. I'll now move on to the cytoplasm of cells. So keep in mind that the cytoplasm, of course, is composed of the cytosol, which is the fluid-like portion of the cytoplasm, and those organelles. I've mentioned organelles once, and I'll mention them yet again to you all, class. Please keep in mind that on your test, being test two, you all will list nine cell organelles and describe those in both structure and function, and you will then describe the ribosome in structure and function. So it'll give you a total of 10 things to describe both structurally and functionally. So I will now class begin with the ribosome. And I say ribosome because I don't necessarily call the ribosome to be a cytoplasmic organelle. I repeat, I do not refer to the ribosome as being a cytoplasmic organelle. Let's begin. So the ribosome, as it is, there are spherical structures that com are composed of protein and RNA. So each ribosome has two globular subunits, meaning there is a large subunit and a small subunit. So with that, what ribosomes do, meaning they provide a structural support and enzymatic activity link to those amino acids that synthesize proteins. In other words, as secondary mRNA leaves the nucleus by way of those nuclear pores, 
it then, of course, is signaled, of course, to attach. So the large and small subunit come together, along with the secondary mRNA, and then, of course, translation occurs, meaning the translation being moving, of course, from that mRNA, that secondary mRNA, to what is on the protein. So unlike many other organelles, I would say the ribosomes are not composed or contained by membranes. Class, this is on page 92 in your textbook. Please use it. So with that, they are scattered in the cytoplasm and bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. So they're either A, free ribosomes, that are free float in the cytosol, and there are B, membrane-bound ribosomes that are attached to the membrane. And of course, this should be attached to the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So from here, we'll move on to the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's begin. The endoplasmic reticulum, I call that a network within the cytoplasm. And as it is, it's just an extensive system of those interconnective tubes and parallel membranes that enclose the fluid-filled cavities, or cisterns. And to say it another way, you could just say that the endoplasmic reticulum is a complex organelle of membranous flattened sacs. So these cylinders and fluid-filled bubble-like sacs are called vesicles. So with this, they interact with the cell membrane, the nuclear envelope, and other cell organelles. So let's begin now. So parts of the endoplasmic reticulum, they part participate, I repeat, in the synthesis of proteins and lipids. So I'll now begin with what is known as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's stated to be rough structurally, you all, because it is studded with ribosomes. So the function, of course, is that proteins synthesized on ribosomes with the rough ER that move through tubules of endoplasmic reticulum, where they fold into a characteristic three-dimensional shape. And then the next thing that happens, class, is that those proteins go to another organelle known as the Golgi apparatus for further processing, which we'll get to in moments from now. Secondly, I'll get down to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it lacks ribosomes, hence its name, smooth ER. So it appears to be more cylindrical than the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the enzymes that are here are important in the synthesis of lipids, is important in the, absorbance, the absorption of fats from the digestive tract, and the breakdown of certain drugs. So with this, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is especially important. I repeat, it's especially important. And they are quite abundant in the liver. And this is what happens, of course, in the event that you happen to drink alcohol or if you've done drugs or ever do drugs. Please don't do drugs. So that's why they are there. Up next class is what is known as the vesicle. So vesicles are membranous sacs that store or transport substances within a cell or between cells. I'll say more about vesicles here shortly. But to mention again, they are an important class to transport things within the cell or between cells. So they contain mostly water when they are of course formed and they show the material between the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. So next up is the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus consists of stacks, stacked flattened membrane sacs. I'll say again, the Golgi apparatus consists of stacked and flattened membranous sacs. I guess to say it another way, that it's a stack of five to eight flattened membranous sacs, and they're called cisternae. So they resemble a stack of pancakes. So what happens here in the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus is that it refines, it packages and transport proteins synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Or to say it the way, I like to think of this as being what happens in the world indeed. Sometimes you may order a package, be it from, thanks a lot, Amazon, or any other place, such as, yeah, thanks a lot, eBay. But of course, that package has to go from point A to point B. So you can say that the Goji apparatus is that, that of course, A, modifies, sorts, packages, and of course, transports proteins. 
synthesized in the roof endoplasmic reticulum. So as it happens, of course, we may have a number of those Golgi apparatus or Golgi complexes within our cells. But what then occurs is once it has been refined, or once it has been modified, processed, and ready for transport, it will be then transported by way of a vesicle. And of course, it will leave the cell by way of exocytosis. Up next, class, will be the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are actually one of the most important membrane-bound organelles of our cells. So with this, I say the mitochondria structurally, it's a double membrane-bound organelle. So with those two layers, it would be, of course, yes, that outer membrane and that inner membrane. So that inner membrane, it folds extensively inward, forming what are known as cristae. So those folds, known as cristae, are here to increase the surface area on which those reactions can occur. And if you don't know what reactions, I'm referring to the reactions of respiration class. It's within that mitochondrion that respiration occurs, called cellular respiration. I'm not referring to breathing, respiring. I'm referring to cellular respiration when I say respiration. So it's within the mitochondrion class that adenosine triphosphate, which is known as ATP, is synthesized. So it's our cells that uses adenosine triphosphate, which I'll say ATP, to power our cellular activities. And therefore, you can just call ATP using that molecule of cellular energy. It powers class everything about us. One thing that I, that I will point out, however, is that our red blood cells have no mitochondria. I'll go to the next. So what happens, of course, is that I mentioned sperm cells and even egg cells prior to now. So what happens is the mitochondria from, of course, the male are excluded from the fertilized ovum. Hence, of course, you all, and of even myself, inherit the mitochondria only from the mother. Hence, you may have heard of mitochondrial Eve from, of course, an evolution course. And I will also mention that your mitochondria does indeed, class, have a small amount of DNA. So from here, I'll move on now, class, to lysosomes. So the lysosomes, it, it's in your textbook as being our garbage disposals of our cells. That's what it states. So with this, they're just spherical membranous organelles containing activated enzymes. And I guess I could just leave it as that. Yeah, I could leave that as that. So as I do continue on with that, also we have enzymes that dismantle debris. And what happens is they're just small membrane sacs. And with that, they have those powerful enzymes that break down proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. And this does indeed include things that are not of the self, things of the non-self, as you may have heard of once. So what your lysosomes do is a digest class, bacteria, that has certain white blood cells involved. And I mentioned the liver again. I say if ever you have a course and you don't know an answer, I also have a dang well great chance of getting that question answered correctly if you just guess liver, because class liver does oh so much. So as I say that class, in the liver cells, our lysosomes break down cholesterol, toxins, and drugs. And even so, I'll say that your lysosomes do also destroy our broken down or worn parts of cells. So with that, your lysosomes class contain an approximate 43 enzymes. So if you have an abnormality in just one type of lysosomal enzyme, it can be, of course, devastating to your health. Next of which we are at now, peroxisomes. So with peroxisomes, I'll say they are membranous sacs. And they look, of course, like lysosomes. So of course they look quite, I guess I'll say quite similar. And there is one thing that I did not mention about lysosomes, and it's, it's important to state. So let me go back to lysosomes one last moment. I didn't mention that in the event that a person has an error class, that lysosomes cannot break down glycogen and certain lipids in the brain, that person is stated to have Tay-Sachs disease. This is, of course, an inherited condition, a genetic condition, and is seen mostly in Jews from Central Europe. 
So those lysosomes lack that one enzyme, which I've just mentioned, it could, of course, could be deleterious. So they lack that one enzyme needed to break down a specific glycolipid in the nerve cell membranes. The result of this, those nerve cells, lysosomes swell with undigested lipids, and they interfere with nervous system function. So if an infant in which class has this disorder is, in, is of course, affected by such, they typically have a doll-like feature and pink translucent skin. With that, at about three to six months of age, signs appear. And with that class, those symptoms progress to mental retardation, seizures, blindness, and ultimately class death. And this is before age five. So I say it's important class to know what happens here on the cell level, on the cellular cellular level. So I can't stress enough that those things known as lysosomes class break down bacteria, viruses, and toxins, and even class break down bone to release calcium ions into the blood. That's one thing I forgot to mention. I'm sorry for forgetting such. Now on class to our left off class at peroxisomes. So peroxisomes are a little bit different. And I say that because they are membrane sacs, I mentioned earlier, but they are in all human cells, but are most abundant class, and yet again class, your liver cells and kidney cells. I wasn't kidding class and I said just guess liver if you don't know. So what happens is those peroxisomes contain enzymes called peroxidases. And what they do is catalyze those metabolic reactions that release hydrogen peroxide, which of course is known as H2O2. In case you haven't heard class, hydrogen peroxide is toxic to our cells. So with that, the peroxisomes also contain the enzyme called catalase. It is called catalase, and what happens is catalase decomposes hydrogen peroxide. So it's the catalase added to those H2O2s, which of course is hydrogen peroxide, and of course it breaks it down class into, of course, water and oxygen. So with that, it also class synthesizes bowel acids that are used in fat digestion. I repeat, lysis, peroxisomes, excuse me, I say again, peroxisomes, also have enzymes that create bile acids that are used in fat digestion. They break down lipids, which of course are called the fatty acids. And then of course they detoxify alcohol. That is class the lysosome. And what I'll move to nextly will be the nucleus. So the nucleus class is not found in, I guess it's a direct order. So if you turn over to page 99 class, you'll find the nucleus. The nucleus is at, is at large, or at least a relatively large organelle. It's shaped like a circle, or at least it's spherical. And with this, it contains your genetic information. It contains your DNA class, your deoxyribonucleic acid. And it is that class that directs, I say, the activities of the cell. So with this, it's it has a complex, meaning it's an extremely long molecule of DNA, and they're a complex class with proteins to form chromatin. So when you think of DNA, it has two states. It has that chromatin state and the chromosomal state. The chromatin state class can be, I guess you say, synonymous with a bowl of noodles that have been boiled, or that have been boiled as opposed to that chromosomal state that looks, of course, like an X. Just keep in mind that it is that nucleus class that contains all of your information. So I say again, all of your genetic information. So now I'll get to, and I won't try to be here long, the next portion being the other cell structures. So your other cell structures class begin here. And they begin class with microfilaments, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. Also when you have some time class, review such things such as actin class such as actin class, and even the myofibrils. Next up, I'll get to, on page three, I guess I'm gonna go to the central zone. In class, keep in mind, none of this we're doing at the moment should be described as a membrane bound organelle. This is completely different class. Next up, I'll get to the, the centrosome class. So well, during cell division, the centrioles, they move to opposite ends of the cell, bound by central fibers class that, of course, pull and distribute the chromosomes. Notice I mentioned chromosomes, and I just explained class. 
that we have two different states of DNA, one state being that chromatin 10 state and one state being that chromosomal state. Up next class are, oh, I mentioned the syndrome already, cilia. So cilia class are here, and they are here class for movement, meaning they're moving substances typically. So as cilia operate class, they bend and they move substances class across the apical surface of the cell or the free surface of the cell. So it's the ciliary action class that moves the oocyte, that female sex cell, toward the uterus. And of course, tibula, which is in the fallopian tube class, is where fertilization occurs. Second of which class, it's cilia that propels mucus class over the lining of your respiratory tract. For instance, those who smoke cigarettes, or just smoke in general class, happen to, of course, destroy or those cilia. In other words, if, if in fact class you've known someone who has smoked and smoked for a while, they may have what is called a, um, I guess I'll say a fair cough. I say that because that person coughs continuously, and it's because those cilia class no longer function to, of course, beat the mucus up and out of those lungs. With that class, infection may ensue. So to contrast class, I'll go on to the thing known as the flagellum. The flagellum class, as opposed to cilia, is a lot longer. And I would say the flagellum class is for movement. And I say movement of what? The sperm cell. So it's the tail of the sperm cell that, of course, is that flagellum that generates that swimming movement. And, of course, allows it to swim class. And I say in the correct direction. So with that, the only known flagellum is, of course, in us class called human. And just for information's sake, males, please watch out with uh, the clothing that is worn. Tight-fitting clothing class can cause, of course, those sperm cells to swim in the wrong direction, if in fact that matters. Next up, what is left out from the presentation that's here, and I, I say again, the PowerPoint class does not, does not have everything that I teach you, or at least everything that you be tested on. Use your textbook. It's the best advocate, I say. It's the best tool for doing well in the course is microvilli. So microvilli are, are on page 98 class, the bottom right hand corner. So microvilli are a tiny extensions class of that cell membrane. And the function class of microvilli is to absorb or absorption. So you find microvilli class in the, I guess I'll say digestive tract, especially class where of the small intestine where of course absorption occurs. So they increase class the absorptive area of the small intestine. That way, of course, it's about the, I guess I'll say, surface area of a football field class. Instead of just being this smooth tube, it's because of those microvilli class that we can, of course, efficiently class absorb foodstuffs that we eat. So we're now class at Clinical Application 3.2 class. Take some time to review A, L, D, and peroxisomes on page 96. In the meantime, I'm moving it on because this is a lecture overview class and not necessarily the entire lecture. So i got to keep on moving to make sure I don't get stuck here or there. So I am now in class going to, I guess, review a bit of what I skipped over. The nuclear envelope class is what, of course, encapsulates. It's that outer portion. And then the nucleolus class is a, a portion of RNA and protein. This is where ribosomes class are produced. And what happens class with chromatin is that it condenses class into the chromosomal state. I'll do more of that later on in the cell cycle. In the meantime, on page 100 class, with table 3.2, you all can see what is called an overview class of cell structures and functions of cell parts. Just make sure you all know which of those are organelles that are membrane bound and which of those class are not. I would not recommend class use this list as this a kind of, I can get it all done like this. Because if you do this class, you will likely include something that's not a cell organelle, such as the cell membrane. It is not an organelle at all. I'll continue. A non class, go to section 3.3. This is on movements into and out of the cell. Passive transport class requires no energy class. Examples of passive transport includes diffusion class, osmosis, even class facilitated diffusion, and filtration. Whereas active transport requires, of course, I say energy. Energy class in the form of adenosine triphosphate, known as ATP. And as it occurs class, being active transport, Substance class will move against the concentration gradient. 
from a lower to higher concentration using energy, as opposed to, of course, with passive transport, moving, of course, those substances along that concentration gradient class using no energy at all from a higher to lower concentration. Let's begin now, class, with diffusion. So as diffusion occurs, class, things that go through the process of diffusion include, class, molecules, atoms, gases, and ions. So as diffusion occurs, class, these substances move from an area of higher concentration class to an area of lower concentration until, of course, equilibrium class is reached. So there is a net movement of particles class from that area of higher concentration class to an area of lower concentration. So with a stated class that substances such as, as I mentioned earlier class, atoms, molecules, ions, and gases diffuse down a concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium. So the same class can be stated in an example, such as having a cube of sugar class, being that solute molecule, placed in a glass of water, that solvent. That class is a perfect example of diffusion. You might see the salt, but after class you can see the salt no more. It is now a solution class and diffusion has occurred. So diffusion class of a substance across a cell membrane can occur only if a class, I say only if the cell membrane is permeable to that substance and a concentration gradient class exists, such as a substance that class a higher concentration on one side of a membrane and, or the other side. So with oxygen class and CO2, class I previewed this moments ago, with oxygen class and CO2, as it states, <coughs> excuse me, the cell membrane class is permeable to both of which, because of course they are lipid soluble. So in the body, oxygen class diffuses into our cell and cells and carbon dioxide class diffuses out of our cells. But equilibrium class is never ever reached. Equilibrium class is never reached. So intracellular oxygen, intracellular oxygen class is always low because oxygen class is constantly being consumed by those metabolic reactants occurring, I would say primarily class, or the mitochondria. So with this, I'll now continue. So the level of CO2 class is always higher inside cells because it is a waste product class of metabolism and accumulates. So the gradient class, the concentration, the concentration gradient, always favors CO2 diffusing, that metabolic waste. All right, so I'll move it on, move it on, move it on. Now class to facilitated diffusion. I won't be here too long. So lipid-soluble substances class, as I just mentioned, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, and even class steroids, urea, ethanol, and just general anesthetics class, can freely cross our cell membranes by simple diffusion. Small solutes that are not lipid-soluble, such as ions of sodium, potassium, and even chloride class, may diffuse through a specific protein channel within our membrane. Keep this in mind, class. So this class is known as facilitated diffusion because it is a facilitated class by way of a protein within the membrane, as you are seeing here, class, in figure 3.22. So with this class, it says facilitated diffusion includes not only class ions and water channels, meaning aquaporins class for water, aquaporins, but it also class those proteins function as a carrier known as carrier proteins. So what they do class is they transport or at least bring in those large water-soluble molecules such as glucose and amino acids. And they're able to, of course, cross that membrane class down the concentration gradient because this is still class part of, part of passive transport. No energy is required here. And with that class, the way in which, I guess I'll say, sugar, meaning glucose, as I just said class, enters into the cell is by way of insulin. So insulin class is required for glucose to enter into those cells, our cells. So just keep it in mind, class. This is how it occurs. So as the protein class allows glucose to enter, meaning that transport protein, the protein class then changes shape to allow class, the glucose to enter into the cell. Up next, class, I'm moving on to what is called osmosis. Please pay attention, class. If you learn it now, you know it forever. And I did say class wherever. 
osmosis class is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And this, of course, occurs in two, of course, that compartment class containing the solute cannot cross that membrane. In your text on page 103, it says, if there is a difference in solute concentration class across a cell membrane, or even a layer of cells, water class will move by osmosis into the compartment class with the higher concentration class of the impairment or trap solute. Let me break it down like this, class, because I need to ensure that you understand what's happening. I'll draw that. I'll draw that. I'll draw this. I'll draw that. And I'll draw that. On this side, I'll draw this. And then I'll also go back over here and I'll go to my pen color and I'll change it class to blue. Now that my pen is blue, and I'll draw more of these that are blue here. So I hope that you all are paying attention and even writing down something that looks similar to this that I'm drawing for you now. I'm going to use this to make sure you understand the process of osmosis. All right, I'm going to stop now. I do believe you can get the gist of what I've done. If you cannot, just please call me at my office cell phone number or email me. I'll begin now. So as osmosis occurs, osmosis class always will occur by moving class from an area of higher concentration of water. This is water. Water, H2. Oh. And this was just as an example to show you. So I say again, osmosis will always move from an area of higher concentration of water to an area class of lower concentration of water. So now that I've drawn that for you, I'm going back to red. Because this, that is red class, represents my sol u. That solute class could be sugar, it could be salt, it could be class, whatever you want that solute to be. So having done this, what I'm saying, class, is that, write this down, please. Water class will always move from an area class that is hypotonic, having a higher concentration class of water, to an area class that is hyper tonic, having a lesser concentration of water. Yet in steel class, I said osmosis occurs class, moving from an area of higher concentration of water to an area class of lower concentration of water until equilibrium is reached. If you can write that down and understand this, there is no question class that I can ask that you understand, and there is no situation class in the clinic that you will come across that you will not class to understand. I'll get more to that class here shortly. But just keep in mind, class, as this occurs, <clears throat> it's important for you all to know. Next up, class, is osmotic pressure. When I think about osmotic pressure, class, this is, of course, the ability class of osmosis to generate enough pressure to lift a volume of water. And that's all it is. So when I think of osmotic pressure, I guess I think about tonicity even. So let's get to class how our cells class behave in these three different solutions. And as I say it this way, well, I'm just going to make it make sense. Pay attention, class. Red blood cells class are normal in isotonic solutions. And when I say red blood cells, I mean all of our cells. They are normal class in an isotonic solution. Isotonic solutions class 
means that the, concentra the concentration class of sol U is the same class both inside that cell and in that solution class in which that cell is in. And to help me with that class, those saline solutions that you may have had, maybe even prior to surgery, if you ever had surgery class, are isotonic solutions. They had a 0.09% class sodium chloride. That's a saline solution, or, or lactated ringers, if you would like to say it that way. So let's move on down to that hypertonic solution. So a hypertonic solution class has a higher concentration class of solutes, such as salt, such as glucose, or whatever that solute that is, than class what is inside the cell. Think about it. So that would make that cell class what? That would make that cell class hypotonic to the hypertonic solution. So the red blood cell class would definitely shrink and lose water. Please write this down. This class is important to know, especially for the future nurses in the class. Next class is the behavior class of our cells in a hypotonic solution. So a hypotonic solution class has less dissolved solutes, no matter what that solute is class, then of course what's within that cell. So keep in mind class what I said to write down moments ago, i.e. osmosis class will always move from a hypotonic solution into a hyperotonic solution, or an area of hypotonicity to an area of hyperotonicity, the red blood cell class will swell and lice, or swell and burst. In class, I'll put it this way for my future nurses class, if in fact you ever, and I mean class ever, give a person class a hypotonic solution class, that will kill them. So please note this class, and, and just to be honest, if you need to, of course, increase the person's blood volume, provide them class that iso the isotonic solution, give them a bag of saline class. And of course, do it per what you've been taught, of course, in nursing school. <clears throat> so now, knowing this class, please keep in mind this because you will find questions such as these on the test. And I say all of this because there was a case in which class a person said, yeah, I had gone to dialysis and the person just couldn't get my blood pressure up or anything on earth. Well, goodness, I'm not a nurse, but I would say if in fact class you were to give that person that saline solution class, if you increase blood volume, you would most definitely class increase the person's blood pressure. And the blood pressure, at least at homeostasis class, would be that approximate to 120 over 80 millimeters class of mercury. Write that down too if you don't know it. I'll move on now class to filtration. So when I think of filtration class, this is by way of a process forcing molecules through membranes by exerting pressure. And of course, filtration is common class to separate solids from water. So when I think about filtration class, I even wrote down an example for you all. It's like making coffee. So you have the coffee filter class, <clears throat> and of course water drips down over those coffee beans with filter paper, and of course it just separates glass, that liquid class, from of course those solids. <clears throat> so with that, I'll move on now class to further being with filtration. So in the body class, tissue fluids form by filtration, and this is when water and those dissolved substance class are forced through those thin, porous walls of our capillaries. So those larger particles, such as plasma proteins, they remain inside. So the force of this movement is what forms those tissue fluids class. This is osmosis at work here. So the force class that forms these tissue fluids, it comes from our blood pressure, and it's generated in larger class by our heart action. So of course, here we go, blood pressure. Blood pressure class is greater inside a blood vessel than outside the blood vessel. However, when those large proteins are left inside the capillaries, it's opposite filtration by drawing water into the blood vessels by osmosis, preventing class the formation of excess tissue fluid, which causes a condition known as edema. So I'm saying all of this class to make sure you know. Bodily fluids class should be in, I say, only two places in the body, normally. A, intracellular, by way of the cytoplasm. B, extracellular class, by way of our interstitial fluid. 
around our cells, such as ions, proteins, and even, of course, the lymphatics. And, of course, it also includes class intravascular fluid, known as our blood. However, class, with those compartments, there is a third space. Keep this in mind. With third space accumulation class, this is when bodily fluid class gets into an area class it should not be. I refer here class to the peritoneal cavity, to the pleural cavity, and even class within that central nervous system. I'm referring class to edema. So fluid class in third space, please write this down, has no physiologic function. In other words, it's those bodily fluids class that do not normally collect in large amounts. So just keep this in mind, class, in the clinic, in, in that hospital, when you're there on the, doing med surge, because you should know, class, that patient's weight. And if you don't weigh that patient before and after, I repeat, if you don't get the weight of that patient class, both before and after, you likely won't catch that the person class is, of course, accumulating fluid in that third space. And if every class you drain fluid off the patient, you should definitely know, class, what volume of fluid you have drank off that patient. Please don't just drain fluid for the purposes of class of draining fluid. Up next class is active transport. As I mentioned earlier, class, active transport requires energy class in the form of adenosine triphosphate. So I'll say it this way. This occurs class when those substances are pumped. Notice I use the word pumped class, not moved. Substances class here are pumped using, of course, energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate against the concentration gradient from a lower class to higher concentration. So as this happens class, a number of times I will refer to, of course, sodium ions, for example, diffusing class through those cell membranes. So we have class, a greater concentration class of sodium ions outside our cells than inside the cells. And it's this reason class that those sodium ions are continually class moved through cell membrane regions from a lower concentration class inside to, of course, that higher concentration class outside the cell. We'll get here in just a moment to further explain this. So, as this occurs class, I always like to think of the sodium-potassium pump in which this occurs. So, of course, three sodium class will be pumped, and of course, two, two, two potassium ions class will be pumped. So, I'll say again, three sodium ions will be pumped out of our cells, and then two potassium ions are pumped into our cells class. This is the essence class of that sodium-potassium pump. Ensuring class, those ions remain class at the appropriate concentration, both inside and outside of our cells. And in case you missed it earlier class, things, excuse me, those particles that are transported actively class include Hydrogen ions class, calcium ions, potassium ions, and sodium ions, as I mentioned moments ago. Not to mention class sugars and amino acids. Get done quickly, class, or at least myself. I'm talking to myself. Make sure you all review endocytosis. It's a type of bulk transport class. Yes, it requires energy. This is class when the cell takes in large substances. It, it was once class known as cell eating. So this happens class by way of, of course, those molecules of class being taken in by the cell by way of that vesicle class forming, and then, of course, just taking it in all together. And it occurs class in one of two ways, being either A, pinocytosis, which, of course, is cell drinking, or phagocytosis class, which is cell eating. I won't deal so much class with receptor-mediated endocytosis. So with this, I'll move on class to exocytosis. And with this class, it's just, of course, a bit different. So this happens class when those substances class are packaged into a vesicle class. That, and this occurs class by the substances being packaged within that cell, the vesicle class fusing with the cell membrane, and being, of course, released outside of the cell. So as this occurs, it occurs class by the way of, for example, maybe, these are examples class, by way of neurotransmitter being released at the septic knob class. We'll get to this, of course, in chapter what is called 10, as well as chapter 9, <clears throat> excuse me. But, of course, by way of those neurotransmitters class being released from nerve cells, it occurs by way of exocytosis. It also class happens, of course, in muscle cells and even in glands. Next up class is transcytosis. 
So with this, it is what moves substance class across barriers of tightly connected cells. And it's this process class that occurs in normal physiology as well as in disease. So HIV class, the human immunodeficiency virus, it causes, of course, AIDS and uses transcytosis to cross those epithelial cells class in the anus, in the mouth, and the female reproductive tract. Please protect yourselves, class. Please protect yourselves, class. And I say this because, of course, HIV class is real. There is no cure. Truvada does exist, but there is no cure. I'll move on, class, to what is known as the cell cycle. I'll do this class rather quickly. The cell cycle class, as it occurs, it's here, class, to ensure that we can, of course, produce new cells. It's a normal part of class. I repeat, the cell cycle is a normal part of what occurs in the body. And if you're wondering what do I mean, it's the cell cycle class that produces, of course, our cells. Meaning without the cell cycle class, we would not be able to, of course, create new cells. So it's a normal part class of everyday growth and division, the cell cycle is. So I'll now class begin with the cell cycle. So it's composed class of, let me pause for two seconds before I jump farther into the cell cycle. In your textbook class on page 109, there is an overview class of movements into and out of the cell, being, of course, passive and active transport and everything I just did with you all. Please review those there. Table 3.3, page 109. So as I was mentioning class with the cell cycle, it is composed class. It's, it's made of two principal phases. They are interphase and end phase. So interphase class is the longer phase in which the cell spend around approximately 10 hours. It is subdivided class by G1 or GAP1. Next up class is S phase or the synthesis phase. And then, of course, GAP2 or G2. Next up class, meaning the second of two phases, is M phase or mitosis. So mitosis class, that second of two phases, is a shorter phase. It lasts about an hour. And it is subdivided class by prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So now let's begin with the process of the cell cycle. I'll begin class with the first two phases. So interphase, where the cells spend most of their time being a part of this integral, integral process, of course, normal growth. And of course, repair of structures class. Gap one. As gap one class occurs, the cell is growing class. Organelles are replicating, and you have our first checkpoint. I'll leave it at that class to make it easy. I won't ask you the world class, but this is the process. Up next class is S phase or synthesis phase. What's synthesized here class is DNA, meaning DNA is replicated. Up next class is gap two. So this is a secondary growth class, meaning the cell and the organelles enlarge, and we get the second of two checkpoints. Notice, I've mentioned checkpoint twice. The first checkpoint class in gap one or G1, and the second checkpoint class in gap two or G2. And then, with this class, the cell can then move into, of course, this, the second of two principal phases, known as, of course, M phase, or mitosis. So by way of mitosis, meaning the shorter phase, it consists class of two things, both karyokinesis, which is the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis class, the division of the cytoplasm. So as it happens, class, I'll begin now with prophase. <clears throat> so as prophase occurs, class, the nuclear envelope disappears. The chromatin condenses class into the chromosomal state, Spinofibers class form from what was once class nuclear envelope. The centrioles class move toward the, toward the poles. And that's the process. Up next class is metaphase of mitosis. During metaphase class, the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate. That's that imaginary class midplane. 
Next up, the spindle fibers class attach to central mirror, to central row, and of course, to century old. So if you were to draw a class, you would have the century old class at the pole, the central mirror class at the center, and the other central century old class at the other pole of the cell, going across that cell. And this class is where you get that third checkpoint. And this third checkpoint class I'll call the point of no return, meaning if the cell class proceeds through this checkpoint, the cell class will divide no matter if it has class, everything it needs or not. So now I'll get to anaphase class of mitosis. Anaphase class. The sister chromatids move to opposite poles of the cell and the cell elongates. So now I hope you get the idea that the cell class is preparing, of course, for division. Up next class is telophase or telophase. So here class, I say this is pretty much the opposite class of what we just learned about being, of course, prophase. So here, I'll do the, in a kind of a similar way, I'll say that the nuclear envelope class reappears, and this, of course, is because of the breakdown class of what was once those of fibers. Also, the chromosomes now decondense from the chromosomal state of DNA to that chromatin state of DNA. And what's a bit different here, class, is now I'll say the cleavage furrow forms, I repeat, a cleavage furrow forms, karyokinesis occurs, which is the division class of the nucleus, Cytokinesis occurs class, which of course is that division class of the cytoplasm, and ultimately class we have two genetically identical cells. This class is the cell cycle. It's here class to repair those structures. It's here class for normal growth, such as the size of organs. It's class integral class, I say to life. It is integral class, I say again, to life. And you can see class all of this, of course, beginning on page 109 and continuing class on to 112, the page number 112. So as I now continue class, let's go to control of cell division. So as the cell cycle proceeds, give me a moment here to take my time. And these figures class are amazing figures. These are from the whitefish blastula that shows the process. And the figures you're seeing here, class, these figures are from 3.36 on page 112. And this, of course, is from an actual cell class using a scanning electron microscope. And it's an at approximate class 2,200 times magnification. How amazing that looks. So control of cell division class, what happens here? It's, it's a number of things that control class whether or not a cell divide and of course, whether the cells will divide and then stop. And just keep in mind, class, that our cells don't divide, class, an infinite number of times. Our cells divide, class, I would say, in our an estimated class, 100 times. And of course, as we age, class, those cells divide fewer and fewer times. So things that, of course, control the cell cycle, or at least regulated class, one of being a cyclin, meaning a cyclin. C-Y-C-L-I-N-S, cyclins class of proteins. They control the regulation class of the cell cycle. So cyclin production class begins in S phase and it increases class in concentration until anaphase. So what do cyclins do class? They bind to CDK. Those are cyclin-dependent kinases. And of course, they bind with CDK and of course to maturation coding factor or MPF. So it's those by way of maturation coding factor class, which is threshold here in mitosis. And then of course, at the end, we get, of course, the anaphase coding factor that initiates anaphase. That's just one way, by way of the proteins class. Another way class is by those cells being nearby one another, meaning cell to cell communication. So it's called contact inhibition or density dependent inhibition. So this is in the repair or in wound healing, and even class with anchorage dependence, meaning those cells being anchored class to that basement membrane. So our next class get to what is called the, uh, let's go on down to 
Let's go to cancer. And to help you with it, class, our cells divide. And they, of course, stop dividing at a certain point. So a tumor class is nothing more than that disorganized mass of those cells. So there are two different types of tumors class that exist, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. So benign tumors class are, or I say removal, there are not tumors that are typically, I guess I'll say, ones that affect you medically or could, or could even cause death. So when I say it that way, class, benign tumors can be excised. They can be removed. And if ever I had a tumor class, I would choose a benign tumor if I could choose. Secondly, class is going to be the malignant tumor. So the, the malignant tumor class is that that is called a cancerous tumor. So it's that malignant tumor class that, of course, is that that metastasizes or that that is metastatic, meaning that spreads class to another part of the body. It's this type class that, of course, has has likely class, I say, affected your lives by now. And if it has not affected your lives, it will affect your life. And I don't necessarily mean you directly. I mean just you or someone, of course, you know, someone you love, or even class someone you're related to. So having done that class, I'll go back to what cancer is. It's just abnormally high cycle production. So I mentioned those checkpoints class to do the cell cycle moments ago. So it's those checkpoints that arrest those cells, class, at those phases, be it, of course, G1, be it class G2, or even class in metaphase of mitosis. So if a cell class is cancerous, it just divides and divides and divides and divides. I guess I'll say without any respect, class, to, of course, the checkpoints. So there are two genetic causes, class, of cancer, or at least two primary ones. It's because of an error class in the RAS gene, that's R-A-S, the RAS gene. And, and to, to help you with that class, an error in that RAS gene, excuse me, I didn't change this, I'm sorry, would of course be what accounts for an approximate class, 30% of cancers. So this deals with that g protein pathway class and cell-to-cell -cell communication. So a mutation class in TP53, that's the other gene. I guess I should have gotten a photo of these genes for you all. But TP53 class is responsible for an approximate half of all cancers that are, of course, caused by something that's genetic, I say. And it's not class all cancers that are caused by, of course, something that's genetic. So with this class, TP53, TP53 class is a tumor suppressing gene. So this is why the person class has that constant cyclin production. And it's all because of mutations class. And to help you with that class, meaning these mutations, class, they occur. I have a daughter now. She's four months old. She doesn't have class nearly any mutations. Right now, I'm 33 years old. I have so many more mutations, class, comparably. And it's the increased class in mutations over time that, of course, lead to cancer. So this is why, class, I, I say what I say, meaning it's environmental factors, class, by and large, that are, that are causing cancers. And you say, what do you mean? Well, it's those oncogenes, those abnormal forms of genes that control the cell cycle, that are overexpressed, and then, of course, those tumor-suppressing genes. And to, to, I'll just say it this way. It's environmental factors such as exposure to, exposure to, to toxic chemicals or even radiation that induce cancer those mutating oncogenes and tumor suppressing genes, or even class smoking or excess drinking. So it's things we do by and large class, those ultraviolet rays that we enjoy here in the South, I guess I'll say. Please uh, wear sunscreen, which I should wear more sunscreen myself because uh, the sun is real. So how cancer can be treated class is in a number of ways. It can be by treatment class, radiation, chemotherapy by way of those chemicals, or even class immune system molecules, known as immunotherapy. And even there are more targeted approaches class two, of course, treating cancer these days. I just really hope, class, you will do all you all can do to ensure that you, I guess I'll say, lessen your chances of developing what is called cancer, especially class having taught the way in which it occurs. 
So from here, I guess I'll mention class from section 3.7, what's called cell death. It's called apoptosis. That's programmed cell death. I told you moments ago, classes, your cells, they don't divide class. I guess I'll say an infinite number of times. So at some point, class, those cells will die. And of course, they'll replace class with the cell cycle. This class has been your instructor, Scholar Huff class. Please take the time to study class, take notes, and prepare well. If you have questions, class, let me know. Thank you all for listening, and enjoy your day.